Namaste. So today we're going to continue with Aparokshanubhuti. <laughs> and we're going to discuss Vairagya, which is sometimes wrongly translated as renunciation. Renunciation is an external concept. And this work that we're discussing sits at the very high end of Raja Yoga, where it meets with Jnana Yoga. So we're not anymore talking about externals here. Everything is internal. Everything is about attitudes and views, not external rules and regulations. That has been internalized in the phase of bhakti yoga. But in Raja Yoga, it is all about cleansing of the mind. So let's look into this further. Om Brahma Dishtavarante Shu Vairagyam Vishayeshvanu Yataiva ka kavishtayam vairagyam taddhi nirvalam Brahmadishtavaranteshu All objects of enjoyment from Brahma Loka Vairagyam indifference Vishayeshu to this world Anu considering their perishable nature, yataiva, just as, kakavishtayang, to the excretia of a crow, vairagyam, indifference, tat, that, he, verily, nirmilang, pure, indifference to all objects of enjoyment from the realm of Brahma to this world in view of their perishable nature, just like the indifference with which one treats the excretia of a crow is verily called pure vairagya. So see, he is not talking about an external action, giving this up or giving that up or prohibiting this or that activity. He's talking about an attitude toward all objects of enjoyment. Why? Why is he being so dismissive? Because they're all temporary. They're all unsatisfactory. They're all not self. These are the three qualities of the material world enunciated by the Buddha that things are temporary, unsatisfactory, and not self. And because of this, we should simply spurn them like the excretia of a crow. It's interesting, the Sanskrit word for crow is kaka. <laughs> Anamata-poetic. But the uh, crow is considered a very low animal because it's a scavenger. It eats whatever it can find. And so it's very impure, like dogs. So just like we don't want to associate with dogs, we don't want to associate with crows, what to speak of their excretia. So this is how the yogi looks at all objects of enjoyment. Money, power, beauty, fame, even learning and renunciation. These are all external objects and they all share these same three characteristics. That they're temporary, imperfect and not self. That means to an advanced yogi, there is only one real object of enjoyment, and that is the self, Brahman. He puts everything else aside. 
You see, this is the deep end of the pool. <laughs> this is not the, the kiddie pool anymore. Huh? This is not for weekend yogis. This is not for meditation hobbyists. This is when you're, you've got the full skin in the game and you're ready to sacrifice everything to get the outcome. What is the outcome? Complete self-realization. Identity with Brahman. We talked about the last time uh, about how the yogi does not see that I am a conscious entity within the body, within the world. Rather, the yogi sees, I am the conscious entity, Brahman, and both the world and the body are within me. This shift in point of view makes all the difference in the world. It makes a difference between being subject to the whims of change of the material body and senses and mind to being their master. Ramana Maharshi one time said, the greatest emperor has nothing on the self-realized being. In fact, compared with the self-realized being, the greatest emperor in the world is but a beggar. How so? Because the emperor is dependent on externals. He's dependent on military victories. He's dependent on economic development. He's dependent on political uh, machinations to rule his empire. And at any moment, any of them could fail. But the self-realized yogi is not only is he completely free of all attachments and obligations, but he rests on the self, which never fails. Just look at it in your own experience. The contents of consciousness are always changing. In fact, every day, we go from waking to dreaming to deep sleep and back again. So the contents of consciousness are unstable. The contents of the mind, even more so. <laughs> there is one sutta where the Buddha was speaking, describing the mind, and he suddenly fell silent. And the monks asked him, why did you stop speaking? And he said, well, I'm trying to think of a simile, a metaphor for the instability and changeableness of the mind. But I can't because the mind is so changeable and so unstable that it's beyond everything. <laughs> so the quicksilver mind is no basis for any kind of lasting peace or happiness. Only the self, Brahman, which is before the world comes to be and remains after it dissolves. This is the real platform of yoga. And now let's look at the next verse. Nityamatma swarupang hi drishyang tad viparitagam evang yo nishchaya samyag viveko vastuna savai. Nityam, permanent. Atma swarupang, Atman in itself. He, verily, drishyang the scene, tad viparitagam, opposed to that, evang, thus, yaha, which, nishchayaha, conviction, samyak, settled, viveko, 
discrimination, vastunaha, of a thing, saha, that, vai, truly. Atman, the seer, in itself is alone permanent. The seen is opposed to it, that is, transient. Such a settled conviction is truly known as discrimination. So we already discussed this in the series on Drig Drishya Vivekaha, but I'll run it by you here briefly. Consciousness, or more properly, awareness, is permanent, unchanging, unconditioned. Consciousness has various objects, which certainly can change, and which condition it to be uh, in different states, such as waking, dreaming, and sleeping. But here, you notice he uses the word svarupam. Svarupam. Sva means the original or permanent. Rupam means form or nature. So our original nature or form is Brahman, the self. Not any of the states of consciousness even. What to speak of the mind, the body, the senses, and all that. And this is viveka, discrimination. That I am not these temporary forms, qualities, and states. I am pure, unconditioned consciousness alone. The self, or Brahman, Atman the being, the one. This is the final truth. There is no knowledge beyond this. And by this discrimination, when applied in meditation, one can separate the self from the various objects that it sees. So, Drig means seer. Drishya means the seen. Vivekaha means discrimination. So this discrimination is to separate the seer from the seen, the permanent from the temporary, the perfect from the imperfect, and the self from the not-self. This is the beginning of real meditation. This is way beyond any concept of meditating on a mantra or on a deity or on a koan. For example, in Zen, there are many koans. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Does a dog have Buddha nature? <laughs> and so on. But this is the ultimate koan. What is the self? Who am I? What is my self? And we'll get into this after the section on qualifications. But the important thing to understand now is that without these qualifications, you don't stand a chance of attaining actual self-realization. Yes, you may get some knowledge. You may even cultivate some siddhis. But that's not self-realization. In fact, those are simply distractions from self-realization. Why? Because they lead us into questions that have nothing to do with discrimination between the seer and the seen. That process, that view is the royal road to self-realization, which is why it's called Raja Yoga. Raja means king. So the yoga of kings is that which leads to ultimate renunciation and ultimate discrimination 
which automatically develops into complete enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.